Hey, greetings, this is Fred in Alaska. Um, thanks for joining me, all the new subscribers. Um, before I before I share, I had some food for thought on. You know, I was sitting there this morning contemplating, you know, why is it people who have experiences feel this overwhelming sense of shame when, and like they did something wrong and they didn't do anything but have something happen to them that they had no control over. It really bothers me. Um, and I don't know what it stems from. I, I, I mean, basically the ridicule, I understand that, but just from the standpoint of they didn't ask for it, it happened and uh, they really got nowhere to turn. <laughs> anyway, and just stuff that bothers me, uh, I'll stop. Um, what I want to share with you today, uh, this guy Jesse, uh, he has a, it's not actually Jesse, but that's how it's said in English, he was a cannery worker from back home in Dillingham, and uh, this is about six years ago now. Uh, in his free time, he would, which they worked 12 and 12, so they didn't have a whole lot, but he would sacrifice his time to go up by uh, Silver Salmon Creek. Uh, and he enjoyed fishing for the, the little trout and the grayling that would come up in there. So when he decided that uh, he was done working that year, um, he allotted about a week's time before he was to fly out and fly back to his home country. And so what he did was, is he got himself a little portable fishing pole and went out, got a ride up to Silver Salmon Creek on Aleknagik Road and decided he was gonna hike from the culverts there. Anyone from back home knows what I'm talking about. There's some culverts that go under the road for the creek. He was gonna hike that and fish it to the mouth where it meets up with the Wood River. So he basically, he, he was planning on camping out, going along a little spike camp, you know, do, do, do his thing, do some fishing, enjoy Alaska before he went back to his home country. So the first night, was basically just uninterrupted just fishing you know I've, I've demonstrated what it's like you know as far as daylight and whatnot but along silver salmon creek there's a lot of thick brush real, real thick brush um as you can tell i got a i got a bunch of thick brush around me but uh so the first night was fine he decides he wants to go a little further and uh i, I forget how many how long it is to the mouth or whatever but uh I, I could check on that anyway so he goes along and he's fishing throughout that that next day and he's having a great time and uh, it just so happens that the silvers are actually moving on in and so he's excited because he's got this little rod and you know this little collapsible fishing pole and he was just slaying the silvers you know he wasn't keeping them he was catching release he he wasn't interested in, in bringing a bunch of salmon or whatever with them and he's literally having the best time of his life just catching these fish uh he kept a couple smaller ones just to eat on while he was there fresh salmon uh, you can't beat it well as he's going along that second day he finds a spot that's suitable for his little spike camp and he's not setting any fires or anything. He's got a little cook stove thing, you know, all that kind of stuff. And as he was cooking up this salmon that night, he had to cut it into real small pieces because a little frying pan for his cook stove is you know, like eight inch diameter or something like that. So he had to cut it up into small pieces and he's frying these chunks. And as he's doing so, uh, he, he lowers the heat and he wants to uh, saute some onions in there with it. So he, he turns around and while it's on low heat, he's cutting up on this onion and he keeps hearing this noise off in the distance. It, he he chalked it up to a, a stray dog because he said it was making kind of a woof, kind of a grunt sound like he would expect a, you know, a stray dog would make or something like that. It was the only reference he had. He had never experienced bears or whatever. And so uh, after he realized it wasn't a dog, he immediately thought bear. Okay. So he had some pepper spray and that was about it and a machete. And so... You know, he kind of stands up, looks around, doesn't see anything, can't make anything out. The noise wasn't consistent to where he felt uh, immediate threat. So he went back to cutting his onion, and he finishes up making his meal. Now, at this certain part of the creek, it, it's a hard bank, and there's a, it's a deep little pocket there. And he decides he wants to do a little more fishing, right? 
you know, he, he left his spike camp as it was. Uh, he had some leftovers, but he put it up on a stump further away from his camp. So if a bear did come in, it wouldn't trash his camp, you know. So he goes along and he's casting into this little pool that, you know, where it eddies there in the, in the creek. And he catches a couple and then things get, he notices it gets real, real quiet. And so while he's contemplating, you know, why is it so damn quiet? He's just kind of looking around, still reeling in, doing his thing. And he notices across Silver Salmon Creek, there's this brown lump about, uh, he, he said about 20 meters. Uh, he's from another country. So he says about 20 meters away. And he decides, yeah, that, that's probably the bear I heard. Thought, okay, I'm going to keep an eye on it. The, you know, that's the noise I heard. Uh, I was justified in being worried. That's the noise I heard. Sorry, the trees are pissing on me. So, he, you know, he keeps an eye and just figures out, okay, that's that's what killed the sound, and that's why I was a little nervous earlier. So he now he knows where it's at. It's across the creek. He doesn't feel immediate danger, so he continues doing what he's doing. Well, he catches the last salmon he was going to catch, and uh, it was a good size one, and he was contemplating keeping it. But silvers, they fight. You know, so as he was trying to unhook it, it slipped out of his hand, bounced off the bank, and right back into the creek, and, you know, fish lost. No big deal. They're, they're in there thick. So he stops what he's doing, and he decides he wants to go back and make sure, because the brown spot was gone. Um, he didn't hear it move off. Uh, it was still dead quiet. Hikes back to his little spike camp, not that far away, probably 300 yards or something, you know, roughly. Well, when he gets to a spike camp, he notices uh, big impressions in the grass and the mud around where he had had his spike camp. And he, he was looking and he was looking at his boots and he was like, man, did I like step and smear, you know, because sometimes you can step and it'll slide a little bit and make the print look a little bigger. But you could usually tell with the track marks that it was a slide and he, he wasn't seeing that. <laughs> so he goes around and he goes and checks where he left his leftovers. And everything that was left in his leftovers had been picked through um because the the oils and stuff had kind of gotten a little more viscous and a little thicker from when you know it was cooked he could see uh what looked like big finger impressions that had taken pieces of the salmon out of this little frying pan so immediately he's like oh man someone one of my friends must be following me teasing me from the cannery uh, because I told him I'd be out here alone, he immediately assumed that it was going to be a prank, you know, something like that. Someone just messing with him, you know, and so he yells out, hey, you know, it's, it's not funny. Uh, and all his buddies spoke his, his same uh, home tongue. So he's speaking in his home language and there's no answer. It's still dead quiet. And he's, you know, he's trying to, he's looking around to see what the hell you know who was moving here he was looking for any kind of track marks as far as impressions from boots and what have you wasn't wasn't finding anything but these big impressions in the ground wherever he could find them there there seemed to be a bunch of them but he said it looked like it had kind of wandered around and came back and then wandered off some more and so he started getting a little little weirded out feeling watched so what he ends up doing as he goes and he closes down his little spike camp and he goes i'm gonna i'm gonna move further because the brush gets a little less dense more more towards the wood river you get so he hikes along after cleaning everything up still dead quiet the whole time not even birds chirping nothing so he gets to a spot and he doesn't like it too much but after a little bit of whacking he, he cut out this little cove for him to be back off the the little trail he was making now there's game trails all in and through here so he was smart enough to not just camp directly on the game trail um he was back off of the game trail he said about six meters again you know his, his reference on distance so uh cut out this little cove he sets up his spike camp and as he's doing so in the distance on the other side of the creek he keeps hearing this weird grunt sound periodically just this deep kind of <coughs> uh i would equate it to probably a, a, a moose call type of tone but uh he he never heard one before so i couldn't i, I couldn't uh i couldn't get a good definite uh 
read on exactly what he was trying to convey because a little bit of a language barrier. He had some broken English. So, you know, I just equate it to that, kind of like a, a moose grunt or a, a deep guttural bear grunt of some kind. So that unnerves him to the point to where he's feeling watched, he's hearing this noise, he's seeing these weird tracks, and he starts getting this inner panic and he said he didn't know where it came from it just it, it struck him like a bolt of lightning according to what he said so immediately he stands up from what he was doing because he's kind of hunched over uh laying out some stuff you know uh letting some of his uh his gear dry out or whatever and he turns around and looks across the creek in the direction he, he just sensed something looking at him off to his right he didn't you know when he turned and looked he didn't immediately see anything and it's kind of thick brush and stuff so when he's looking he does notice about you know according to him it was about uh 25 meters 30 meters away something moving next to a tree none of the other trees were moving but this one thing was moving and he said it was like a a very very dark brown uh darker like a chocolate brown and so it caught his attention so he's watching he had a, a small little pair of binoculars so he goes down the creek a little ways to get a better line of sight on this thing and, and use the binoculars so what he's doing that and he's trying to figure out what is this thing because all he could see was just as dark he said it it was like a mix between fur and hair fur and human hair it, it was a little matted a little little tangly looking and it wasn't very long he said about you know three inches or so and he keeps watching it and so he's kind of transfixed on this particular spot moving now as he's doing that he starts hearing noises way far behind him like way far behind him it it appeared and so he kind of loses focus on the thing with the binoculars because he's not really seeing much and turns his attention to the noise he's hearing well sees nothing gets weirded out feels like he's being watched he, he gets real hyper paranoid goes back to camp uh, which wasn't very far away. He he maybe went, you know, 30, 40 feet away from his camp and he picks up his machete and he starts making noise. He starts hacking stuff, just making noise, you know, speaking in his home tongue. He starts singing a song, um, a song his grandma taught him just as a kid, you know, so he's singing away and just whacking bushes and stuff, making noise. He wants to run off whatever it is. And that's the best option he had at the time. So as Jesse's doing this, the noise he heard way off in the distance uh, within a 10, 15 minute period of time. He said he was he was hacking away, singing the song about three or four times and uh, you know, just making as much noise as he could. He hears the identical sound again, but it sounds like uh, bipedal footsteps, crunch, 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 crunch. And it sounds like he's coming directly at him at a distance though. So immediately he's like, oh, Man, I must be attracting a bear so he goes back over by his camp from where he was thrashing bushes not far away and decides he's gonna pack up and start hacking you know uh, heading back towards Electnagic Road now as he's as he's loading up his stuff he keeps hearing this crunch crunch and a thudding step he said it sounded like a man walking but much much heavier and he wasn't seeing it but it sounded like it would come towards him walk off a little ways then walk back towards him a little ways and then off a different direction so he was really getting concerned that someone was stalking him uh, but it, it was it was surreal hold on one second my apologies there uh international call from canada not really international but you know just, anyway so <clears throat> he hears this thumping boom boom yeah you know it's going back and forth but it's staying a steady distance from him and so he gets more and more panicked as he's loading his stuff up you know um he's he's minimizing what he brought with he he leaves his cook stove he's getting stuff just stuffed in his backpack because he keeps getting this overwhelming feeling i gotta go so he gets all his stuff together and he notices it's quiet and and the stepping and the stomping has you know uh, kind of ceased a bit and immediately he starts taking inventory of what's around him he starts looking around looking around and he looks back across the creek and was looking back at that where he had saw that that dark blackish brown thing by the tree and he notices 
it's not there. And so immediately he starts looking further around, trying to you know pinpoint where it's at. He he's checking the whole area, moving around a little bit. He's he's nervous to start walking. He wants to make sure he's not walking into a bear or what have you. So as he's taking a little uh, inventory of what you know, what his options are. Loon flying by. Uh, he stops and he's he's doing he's adjusting something on on his boot. And as he's doing so, he's kind of glancing up every once in a while, just kind of really hyper paranoid. And as he stands back up and starts walking down the trail again, he's looking around. He's got his spray out. And he's got he's got his machete on his hip, ready to go. And uh, as he's doing so, something stops him in his tracks. Uh, he was walking along. He just stops, and he feels like he's frozen and just he was overcome with fear that he didn't understand and so as he's kind of kind of moving and forcing himself to move around and look around and try to shake this this paralyzing fear he looks back across the creek and that's when he sees this thing standing there uh he said it looked to be about nine foot tall it didn't look uh overly muscular it looked kind of like a oversized chewbacca with no neck and uh when i asked him what did its face look like he said that uh, around the eyes there was no hair or on the nose, but everything else had, it looked like a old man's beard. And when he initially saw, he thought it was a, a, a trapper or something, you know, from the 1800s just standing over there, but it was in a, a fur coat. So he, he says, hello in English, hello. And when he said, hello, this thing looks at him, turns and walks off into the brush. And that's when he realized exactly what was going on because there was no seams and for a coat, none, none of that stuff. And immediately his heart starts racing and he turns to go. And as he's going down the trail, he realizes this thing is going the same direction I am just on the other side of the creek. So he stops and he decides, I'm going to hike the other way and give this thing time to clear the area. So he turns around, starts hiking back down the trail. He gets back to where his little camp was and he decides he's gonna pick up the stuff he left and, and calm down and catch his breath and just take a minute before and then, then head back. So he does all that, whole time feeling watched. Now, when he's done packing up his stuff and he turns to head back towards Aleknagek Road, uh, as he's progressing down the trail, he gets to the spot where he turned and looked and saw this thing staring at him and there's there's nothing there he gets a little further down the trail and he notices uh in this open area where there looks like the bank was freshly something came down the bank on the other side and he notices on the side of the trail he's on that the brush has been disturbed and something came up on excuse me on his side of the trail immediately the hair stands up on his neck he's really freaked out because uh, in his mind's eye he sees this thing head cross there and he needs to go so he kind of gets up to where it came out he's looking for tracks couldn't see anything some water dripping and whatnot and decides it's time to really go so he starts hauling ass down this trail and you know a good portion of its game trail and the other portion he kind of kind of bushwhacked through so it wasn't easy traveling it wasn't just like this wide open trail he was going through stuff you know he, he was making his way well as he's running along he realizes in his panic he's working away from the creek which is his guide back to the road he doesn't want to get turned around so he cuts back towards the creek now he's going through all this devil club and some other stuff he gets back up to the trail he was on this little game trail and takes a breather because he, he's trying to slow his heart rate down he feels like he was going to have a heart attack from the panic because uh the panic feeling never really left him it would just kind of kind of pulsate sometimes stronger sometimes weaker but it was always a panic feeling so he catches his breath and starts calmly walking down the trail trying to calm himself now he gets to about uh he said uh it was less than a mile from the road he could hear a car way way down the road coming along the asphalt and so he figures okay if i move fast enough i can catch that car as it's going by to wave it down and get a ride uh because his friends weren't going to be coming to get him for another day and a half two days something like that so <laughs> he starts running towards the running towards the road 
he's making his way through the brush and he trips and falls and the way he fell because of his backpack wasn't fully secured a bunch of stuff from his backpack flew over his head out of the backpack and spilled in front of him right so immediately he's like crap he, he unsnaps his backpack he's trying to stuff everything back in there and, and latch things up and as he does so he stands back up gets it on and hears a noise behind him off behind on his left hand side so he turns and looks and this thing was less than 20 feet away standing there holding a tree just looking down at him like what are you waiting on like you know continue going so that's immediately what he does you know he starts barreling he said he never ran so fast in his life he tripped and fell a bunch of times more stuff fell out of the backpack he didn't care and when he finally made it up to the road he had just missed the car that went by but heard another one coming and it just so happened the the person coming by was uh basically uh local law enforcement he i, I won't elaborate because it's too small of a place you know they only have troopers in dillingham pd so anyway uh slows down asks him hey are you all right you look a little frazzled he said no i'm just fine i saw a bear i got panicked you know immediately covered up his own his own story you know i saw a bear and uh of course the, the officer lets him in and gives him a ride back to town and so uh he stopped working for the cannery he doesn't uh not not to laugh at you jesse uh just your expression about it really really cracked me up um inside thing i apologize so uh yeah that's what happened to jesse and uh you know again that that spotlights uh you know something happened to this guy Grant you it wasn't overly uh, aggressive, it was just a presence. Yeah, he said the fear was all in himself. There was no outward display of showing of teeth. There was minimal growling even. And it was mainly the feeling of being watched that really messed with him. Um, anyway, and again, you know, to touch on what I was speaking about at the beginning, you know, so many people hold these experiences with this weird shame. And, and it bothers me that it, there shouldn't be so much ridicule for something that is, uh, it's not necessarily commonplace, but it has happened a lot. It, it should be being discussed openly to rid the ridicule and, and, and treat it for what it is, which is a strange phenomenon that just doesn't stop happening. You got credible people. Uh, I, I can't, I can't speak on it, but there's a bunch of credible people that have shared their experiences with me and I've shared them with you guys, that you, you can't even, in a court of law, all it takes is two solid witnesses in certain states, you're a dead man if they saw you commit a crime that is worthy of the death penalty. You're done. Two, two credible witnesses. And, and we got way more than that going on here. Um, not that anyone needs a death penalty, I'm just saying, in a court of law, you, and it's frustrating. I'll leave that alone. I don't want to get all worked up. Uh... Again, Jesse, thanks for sharing. Sorry about the uh, miscommunication at times during our conversation because it gets lost in translation sometimes. But uh, again, uh, shout out to him and also uh, his mom. Uh, I believe it was Esmeralda. If, if I'm wrong, shoot me an email or give me a call, Jesse. But uh, hello to Esmeralda. Thanks for watching. And um, we'll catch you guys on the next one.